Hey everybody, it's uh, Christopher Dixonland Farm and I'm going to show off something I built. It's right here. It's a switch box for my flight simulator. So, if you wanted to just know what I did, I custom built this. You can turn off the video. But we can go through why I built it and uh, as your interest wanes you can uh, disconnect and then we'll get to the nerdy stuff. Originally I shot this kind of uh, showing you how I built it, but then I realized nobody really cares. They just really kind of care about the end product. So, uh, you know, I mapped it all out, drew schematics, you know, figured out a game plan, what things that I want, then I went ahead and used my drill press to drill out the uh, places for the switches and, and, and buttons, and then I started wiring it all up and soldering it to a teensy board is what I used, which is about the size of a pack of gum, and then I soldered it all up and, and got the dual rotary encoder with push button and a USB cable and uh, went ahead and drilled that part out and coded it up and here we go. So why did I build this? Well, if we look on Amazon we can see that there is a commercial product to fulfill this need of being able to control things physically in the real world that control it in the simulator but they are kind of expensive. All told it's roughly around $400, just shy of that. And the products, if we take a look at some uh, Google images, they're, they're large. So this thing is smaller than a, a shoebox, what I made, right? It's, you just saw it, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty tiny. A little bit bigger than my, my throttle quadrant that I've got. So these things take up space, they cost money, right? So. Uh, we can see in the images here. They take up real estate that I didn't want to do. The price, when I was done with what I did, was roughly a hundred dollars. Also, it wouldn't do everything the way I would want to do it, and it would still be missing some functionality. So that's why I went the custom route. Uh, the one thing, while you can control radios and things like that with uh, the one side tech panel, the one thing you can't control is the GPS, and I find the GPS very annoying to control. Let's take a look at the plane real quick. You can see it goes from big to small, and you use your mouse wheel to control. And if we look at the, the distance that I'm moving with my mouse, it's very small, and very often I would accidentally bump, and then all of a sudden you're, you're changing something that is not what you wanted to control. It gets even worse when you look at an angle. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's very fiddly. So I found that very annoying. To get around this problem, if I used a out-of-the-box solution, it wouldn't address this problem. And going custom programming would. So, like I said, roughly $100, I got the Teensy board, which is about the size of a pack of gum. And let's take a look at that online real quick. See, it runs $26, and it does require some soldering and wiring. You can get headers, uh, so that way you can use crimp connectors. So if soldering is not your thing, that's okay. I'm very comfortable with soldering since I've done that in, in ham radio. And you have to solder uh, for the switches, probably. Though I guess you could probably do all that with crimp connections, too. But it wouldn't be as effective or as easy, in my opinion. So the board itself was $26. The rotary encoder is a special item that was available on Amazon for $18, meant just for flight simulators and people doing this kind of cockpit building. The switches and buttons were uh, $20 combined. The enclosure was, I think, $18. And then I bought some special wire, which I didn't have to do, but I decided to do that. And I bought a new soldering iron with a micro tip pencil because I wanted to make sure that I had the right kind of soldering iron opposed to the iron that I had. I probably didn't need that, but it was only $10. So again, all in told, roughly $100. So let's go ahead and see the device in action, right? So we uh, turn on the parking brake, you can see, boom, the parking brake just turned on. If I turn the battery on, battery switch turns on, the alternator switch, the alternator switch turns on. If I turn the fuel pump on, Fuel pump turns on. Look at that. Everything's working out just great. The magnetos would be uh, where the key is. So if I go left, right, 
that means both are on. See if I do just one, it goes in the correct position. If I go ahead and start the engine, which would be turning the key, you can hear that everything starts. It's so one of the nice things I was able to do with the custom programming was make multi-use buttons. So, for example, this is view one here, right? If I hit view two, it goes to view two. Hit view three, it goes to view three. But if I hold down shift plus buttons, or these two buttons together, different things happen. So for the plain exterior, if I hold down both buttons, there's the plain exterior. If I did the flyby, which is all together, that would be that view. And there's view seven programmed in. So I'm able to do all of those extra functions, which saves the button real estate here, and also uh, the inputs. I didn't have to program in uh, or solder in as many inputs, right? I turn the avionics on here, uh, and I use COM1. We take a look. By rotating the knobs, I can control COM1. If I held down SHIFT and COM2, if we look underneath at COM2, now I'm controlling COM2. If I hit the heading barometer, one controls the heading bug. And if I turn faster, you can see it actually turns faster in the simulator. And then the bottom one controls the barometer setting. So I can control setting that so I can have the correct altitude reading. Again, if we go to the GPS mode here and I held down uh, shift plus GPS, then I'm controlling the GPS. I also programmed in the autopilot mode here so I can control autopilot. I can put it in heading mode there. I can put it in navigation mode. I can put it in approach mode. I can turn the um, yaw damper on or the flight director depending on uh, the aircraft if it has those functions. Same thing with the prop sync so for uh, dual engine airplanes and they have a prop sync I can turn that on. And even if, let's say, it was nighttime, I could hit the flashlight. Now you can see I've got a flashlight on. Folks, I did a whole video of me talking about the coding here, but I'm even bored. I'm bored telling you all this stuff. Uh, while it, it looks impressive, it's not, it's not really. It's just broken up into a lot of different steps. Um, what I'm basically doing is I'm setting up the switches. I'm setting up the commands here. And I, there are online guides, and that's how I did it. And while some of it I coded myself, a lot of it was built on the shoulders of other people who showed their examples. And uh, there are special commands I had to run because if you buy uh, third-party planes, they don't always use the standard commands. They use their own special commands uh, for various reasons. If they just used the built-in commands, it would have been a lot easier but they don't so uh, you can see in this section of code here when I turn on the magnetos uh, I, I do it for the normal airplane but then I do it for uh, like several different other airplanes that use their own special commands and then I add a little delay in there to make sure that I run it I do the commands uh, here, falling edge and rising edge. That means that I just turned the switch on, do something. Did I just turn the switch off, do something? Uh, I did it that way because because of those special commands, uh, things would happen if I kept on saying, you know, if the switch is on, do this. If the switch is on, do this. Switch is on, do this. And you'd hear all these clicking noises as it constantly tried to do stuff, uh, opposed to just doing it once and things would fight with the built-in commands so I learned the hard way. The parking brake was honored throughout every plane that, I, that I've, I've had so uh, that's where you can see the commands a little different and what I do is if the switch is uh, on and if the parking brake is not on turn it on otherwise do the opposite is the parking brake supposed to be off? Is it off? Yes, forget it. Parking brake is off, it's not, turn it off. That's what th those 
command lines are doing. Otherwise, you can see a lot of this is just if rising edge, falling edge. Did I just do something, then do it. Otherwise, forget about it. And then I also set up these timers. And the reason why I set up the timers were uh, that multi-function thing. If you hit like button one, button two, it would kind of do both commands and you'd see like command one, command two happen right away. So I set up this timer where it gives you a little bit of lag. So if, if you can't, and you'll never get it perfect. Uh, it gives you a little like 50 millisecond window where you can kind of hit the two and it ignores until that timer is passed. And every time you hit a button, it just resets that timer. So like you hit one, two, three, you know, the timer would have gone one, reset, reset. And then it'll check and then I'll go, oh, okay, you meant all three buttons. Okay, do this. And that just took a lot of trial and error and I figured it all out. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I don't, I can't really help most of you who might have questions um, because this is unique to everyone's situation. I did have fun having the project. I did do it in steps. Instead of trying to tackle it all at once, I just did one thing at a time and took some time and it's, it got frustrating some parts but a lot of the frustration came from this coding um, I don't program in this language ever this is the first time and it was very specific about where brackets were and where semicolons were and I would forget and all of a sudden it wouldn't run and it was always due to because I forgot a closing bracket or I forgot a semicolon very rarely it was the actual code one time it was and I just worked my way around it so that's it from Dixie Nerd Farm, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.